Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining. I'm Aaron Parecki, and looking forward to today and to talk about how to build a secure website from scratch. Uh, a couple of logistics. We've got uh, an hour here today, and um, we're going to be covering some um, some topics in slides, and then I'm going to do a demo of actually building, writing some code live as well. Um, if you do have questions, I'm happy to take questions during the session. I can't promise I can get to all of them, but I'm happy to do that. Uh, if you do have a question, make sure to use the Q&A box in this uh, interface. I won't be paying attention to the chat, um, although that might even be disabled, so that makes that easy. But do use the Q&A box here, um, and that makes sure that gives me an easier way to keep track of the questions and, and, um, and answer them. So um, with that out of the way, um, let's get started. So um, I'm Aaron Parecki, and um, I've been involved in OAuth group for a while now, working on the actual uh, OAuth specs. And that is, of course, probably the industry standard for um, getting for doing login on websites now. Um, and we're going to talk about what OAuth is and why it's better than just using like a password, for example. Um, I also maintain the website OAuth.net, so if you do have any questions about, about things as we're going, this is a great place to look them up. And I try to make sure that's up to date and uh, a good resource for finding other blog posts or videos about the different concepts that we're going to be talking about today. So that is a fantastic resource. Um, so. We're going to start with a little bit about what OAuth is and why it matters, because this is kind of the foundation of um, of building a login page into a website these days. This is the spec, the OAuth spec. And if you ever tried to read this, I apologize, because it turns out specs are actually terrible at being tutorials. They're not really meant to be that. They're more like a legal contract that you would you know read after you're already familiar with the sort of with the landscape. So not the best way to learn it. And the worst part about OAuth is that it's not even just one spec. It's actually a whole bunch of specs put together. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Some are good, some are bad. And that's just the way it is. And um, I completely recognize that it's a little bit overwhelming to try to figure out how to get through that. So we're not going to go through the specs in order because it would be very boring. And it wouldn't make a lot of sense. So instead, we're going to talk about why we even have OAuth in the first place, starting with a little bit of background on what we had before OAuth. So before OAuth, it was actually very common for um, third-party apps to request your login to providers like Google. Or um, you know, if, 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 if an app like Yelp wanted to get access to your address book that lives in Google, it would ask you for your Google password. We understand now that this is like a terrible idea. We would never go around typing our, uh, you know, our Gmail account login into random apps like Yelp or Facebook, but th it was very common at the time because there wasn't a big, there wasn't much of an alternative, and this is really what drove the creation and adoption of OAuth, which was, well, okay, users do want to give ac access to their contacts to Yelp because of whatever Yelp is promising them. However, giving it, you know, giving Yelp their password means that that app can then do anything on their account and access all of their data. So we're looking for a way to let applications access one part of the account while not having be able to access other parts of the account. And this was the original sort of problem statement that OAuth set out to solve, which was how do we let apps access data without giving the app the password? And this holds true even for uh, for first party apps. It doesn't have to be a third party app issue. Um, it was originally developed for third party apps where you'd have like, you know, a, an app by this brand accessing data from this other brand, you know, Yelp trying to access data from Google, or Last.fm trying to access data from Spotify, or you know, Buffer trying to post tweets for you. And that's all fine, but it turns out it's actually also useful for first party apps as well for a couple of reasons that we're going to look into in a second. So this is really what drove OAuth. And as all these companies were uh, starting to build out APIs for the first time, they realized they all had the same problem. So they started working together and actually wrote down a standardized way of doing it, which is what we now know of as OAuth. 
So now you go to Yelp and you don't see a give me your Gmail password. It's all these buttons like log in with Google, log in with Facebook. And this is actually um, sort of interesting because, again, the original goal of OAuth was to get access to data in APIs. It was not actually about making a single sign-on protocol. So nothing in OAuth actually talks about who the user is. It's always about just getting access to an API. So I like to think of this analogy of um, checking into a hotel where you go to the you go to the hotel, you go to the front desk, and you show that person your ID and credit card. They give you back this hotel key. You take that hotel key, and you walk up to your room, you swipe the key on the door, and the door opens up and lets you in. This is actually exactly analogous to OAuth because the person at the front desk is the authorization server, the one responsible for guarding access to the keys, handing them out, checking IDs, things like that. That key card is an access token, and it gives you access to one or more APIs, like the room of your of your hotel, or the pool, or the gym, or whatever it is. And um, this has a couple of really important properties, which are also the same in OAuth, which is that um, which is that if you are using this hotel key, you don't actually care what's on that hotel key in order to use it. You just care that the door knows what's on the hotel key. So you don't actually need to be able to read it. You just need to be able to approach the door and use it. And that's exactly the same as with OAuth. OAuth access tokens do not get interpreted or read by the application that's using them. They get read by the API instead. So if you do want to know about the user, you need something besides OAuth because OAuth doesn't give that to you. And that's where OpenID Connect comes into play. So OpenID Connect takes OAuth as a base, as a foundation, and then adds in the uh, user identity information on top of it. So we're going to start by talking about how OAuth works and eventually get into OpenID Connect and then see how to get data about the user. Um, so the OAuth uh, spec is based around this idea of, uh, you know, right, the goal is to um, get an access token. And once the app has the access token, it can go and access an API. Eventually, we're going to get to learning about the user. But um, how it gets the access token actually depends on a lot of factors, like where the app is running, you know, what kind of app it is, what the environment it's running in. And uh, there's a lot of options that the OAuth framework gives us for these kinds of applications. Turns out the primary one is the authorization code flow, which is the one that we're going to talk about today because it is the most common and it's the most useful in the most different environments. It's useful for traditional web apps that are running on a server. It's also useful useful for mobile apps. It's useful for single page apps. And you could even use it with command line apps. It's a little bit weird, but you could. Um, then there's also the device flow, which we're not going to cover today. But that is um, for uh, devices that don't have a browser in them, like an Apple TV, for example. There's also the uh, client credentials grant, which is for when there's no user present. It's just machine to machine. And there's a couple of deprecated flows as well, um, which is uh, because of some security concerns with them and the environment they were created in is a lot different now. So we'll talk about a little bit about those, but we're going to focus on the recommendation of the authorization code flow with Pixie. Um, so at the point, though, is that at the end of all of these flows, the result is that the app has an access token, and it can now go and use the access token to make an API request. Regardless of which flow was used, it doesn't matter after the access token is issued. So to um, start, we are going to take a look at sort of step zero, which is client registration. If we're going to build an app, if we're going to build a website and then you know, secure it with OAuth, we need that website to have its own identity within the system, within the OAuth system. Um, for this uh, demo, I'm going to actually uh, use an Okta developer account, which I have created ahead of time. So I'm going to switch to uh, show you my computer screen. And what I've got here is um, I've got an Okta developer account from developer.okta.com. And um, 
this is a uh, this is a free account, and it has like a lot of the features enabled that you don't get on the other Okta accounts. So this is a great way to try this stuff out. It gives you a no-auth server on your account. Um, step zero is client registration, which is the idea that this application that we're going to build actually needs to have its own entry in Okta, in, in whatever your OAuth server is. So I'm going to go here, click Add Application. We're going to build a web app, because we're going to write this code, uh, which will eventually be running server side. And we're going to call it auth code demo. And for this demonstration, we're actually going to write um, this. I'm just going to write this application as like a one file application, which is just to demonstrate how little code actually is required in order to, to do this. Um, so I'm going to send the redirect URL just to the same home page of the app, because I'm only going to be creating one file. Registering that will give the app a client ID and a client secret. Now, I get a client secret because I, I chose the option of a web server app. So here, I've now registered the app. This app now has its own identity in the system, which means it has things like uh, different, um, you can associate different permissions or settings within this application. And now we are able to um, go ahead and you know start one of the OAuth flows. So the client ID identifies the app. The client secret is effectively the app's password. And it's really important to treat that the same way you would treat a password, as in don't check it into your, your source code. You know, the app needs to protect it. So uh, we're going we're gonna to have to keep that in mind. The other thing about the client secret is that some applications can't use client secrets. And that's because they don't have a way to protect it. So for example, um, what what we chose when we uh, created that app in Octo was you know the web server app, and that's known as a confidential client in OAuth terms. So in OAuth, in OAuth terms, a confidential client is one that can hold on to a client secret and keep it secure. Um, that is the the opposite is a public client, which does not have the ability to keep strings secret. And examples of those would be things like mobile apps and JavaScript apps. Now, this is a tricky one because um, JavaScript apps, if it's a entirely JavaScript app, like a single page app running in a browser, there's no server backend. Whatever you put into your source code of the JavaScript app is delivered to users in their browser, which means if you were to try to put an API key or something in there, uh, it wouldn't be secret anymore because anybody could just go and view source and start poking around and seeing whatever you've put into the source code. So you can't use a client secret in a JavaScript app. The same thing is also true with mobile. It's a little bit harder, but there's plenty of tools available to you know decompile the binary file that you get from the app store and start poking around and looking at the uh, looking at the, the contents of the binary file. So again, you can't use a client secret in a mobile app. Now, what's the client secret good for if we can't use it in the mobile app? Well, it's really just like an extra layer of security within the whole system. And as we'll see, it's not actually needed in order to successfully get an access token. So we're going to start with um, we're going to start with by talking about the recommended flow, which is authorization code flow and Pixie. And then we're going to do a little demo of actually building, writing this code to protect this website, which I'm going to then, um, you know, we're going to create this website from scratch in one file. So um, authorization code flow plus Pixie. This is, the, this is the recommended way to get an access token for an application to get an access token and also eventually the user's identity information about who just logged in. Pixie was uh, actually developed a while ago specifically for mobile apps, but it turns out that it's got a bunch of useful properties that make it also useful for um, every application. So it's just the recommendation now. Um, let's take a look at how this works step by step before we actually dive into the specifics of uh, of actually using the uh, of actually looking at this on the wire and then eventually writing the code. So up at the top, we've got our sort of the players involved in this exchange. And 
we start off with the uh, the user is you know using like a phone for example it doesn't have to be a phone it could be their their computer browser accessing the application and that application um, might be an app running on the phone or it could be an application running up on a web server that they're accessing from a browser it doesn't matter where it's running it still is considered to be the application in the, in the OAuth sense the OAuth server is the one that's going to be issuing access tokens. Now, if you're using Okta, Okta is playing this role of the OAuth server, and you don't have to worry about um, how how it creates access tokens or how it handles you know, validating you know, user logins or anything, because all you care about is the other end of it, which is either protecting an API or a website. This API um, is where we're going to eventually send the OAuth access token to, to be able to go and you know, access data behind that API. So, Let's start the flow with uh, the user is you know looking at the app or launching the app or going to the app's website and clicks the button that says log in. That is going to uh, the app is going to say, okay, hang on, I'm going to generate a new secret right now, random string, and I'm going to hash the secret. So a hash is a one-way operation, and um, a very simple hashing algorithm might be sum. So if I told you to pick ten random numbers between one and hundred, add them all together, and tell me the the answer. Um, I would not be able to tell you what 10 numbers you chose. So that's not a very good hashing algorithm because eventually I could figure it out or at least make a couple of guesses. Um, but that is that's the idea. So in reality, we use a much better hashing algorithm. Um, but it's 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 the idea where even if someone has the hashed value, they can't um, they can't actually know what the original value was that made that hash. Okay, so we've got. The app hold on, holds on to the secret, calculates a hash, and then gives that hash value back to the user to say, hey, go over to the OAuth server. Like, I don't want your password. Uh, I, don't want to, I don't want to deal with trying to remember, like, figure out how to validate passwords. Um, the, the nice thing about avoiding, about the application not needing to ever touch passwords is now you never have to worry about whether the application is actually properly protecting passwords. So the app never actually touches it. Um, so the app says, all right, go over to the OAuth server, redirects them in a browser to the OAuth server with that hash value. So the user is now approaching the OAuth server saying, all right, I'm trying to log in into this app. Here's this hash value it gave me. Here's my, also my client ID that was part of that first registration step. Um, the OAuth server says, cool, who are you? This is where the user logs in. Their, their password lives in the OAuth server, so the OAuth server is where they're going to be entering their password to confirm their identity. After they approve that request and log in, the OAuth server says, great, take this temporary code back over to the app. So the user uh, takes that temporary code, delivers it, brings it back to the app by visiting the app's website again, and says, all right, I got this from the OAuth server. You can use this to get an access token. Now the app can say, all right, here's the code I got from the user. Here's that original value, that plain text I used to generate the hash. Please give me an access token. The OAuth server is able to take that original value, calculate the hash, compare the two hashes from the, the first step and the last step, and issue the access token. And now the app has an access token, or as we will later see, also an ID token to get data about the user, and they can, they're now logged in. So there's two different color lines here, right? The, this is the difference between the front channel and the back channel. And this is a really important concept of, around um, why this stuff works this way and why this is secure. So the whole first half of the uh, exchange is, are the blue lines are front channel requests. The idea with the front channel is that it's actually using the address bar of the user's browser to move data from between two machines, right? We've actually got data moving around between the OAuth server and the app, which are pieces of software, but we're using the user's address bar to move data around between those two. The, that's the sort of weird one. The normal one is the back channel request, which is like an HTTP request from a client to a server, which we're all very used to, and we kind of take it for granted. There's a lot of benefits of the back channel that we sometimes just forget about, which is that um, by using the back channel, the application actually knows it's talking to the right server because it's making an HTTPS request, it's secure, it's encrypted, and the response comes back in the same connection. That's all great. 
Um, I like to think of that as hand delivering a message where you can walk up to somebody and give them a thing. Uh, you can see who they are. They can see who you are. You can see that they took it. You can see that nobody else is coming along and, and you know, stealing it away from you as you are doing the handoff. Sending data over the front channel is more like throwing it over a wall where you can't actually see over the wall to see if they actually caught it. And this is really important. So anytime you send or receive data from the front channel, you're missing some visibility into the, into the exchange. From the sending point of view, you can never really be sure that it got there. You might be like pretty sure, but you can never actually be sure. And on the receiving end, you can't actually see where it came from. All you know is that something appeared over the wall, and hopefully it's from the place you thought it was, but it could have been somebody else throwing something over the wall at you instead. And there's just no visibility, so we never are actually sure. So you might be wondering, why do we uh, use the front channel at all? And the reason is because this is how we actually ensure that the user is at their computer and uh, you know was actually there and did actually log in, and then it isn't the app just taking the password from someone and saying, oh yeah, no, totally, the user said it was okay, right? We want the OAuth server to be sure that the user did approve this request and was in front of the computer. It also means that the thing receiving data doesn't need a public IP address like a mobile phone or a single page app doesn't actually have uh, a public IP address that a remote server could push data into. So this is a great way around that problem as well. Okay, so that's the summary. Let's now walk through this step by step, and then we're gonna go actually write code to do this. So step one, the app generates a uh, random, that random string. This is called a code verifier. I don't like the name. Um, I always get the two mixed up. It's code verifier and code challenge, but generates a random string. Um, this is the this is the, the the secret or the one time use secret. It has to be a certain length, certain characters. Um, the uh, then the app calculates the hash, which is a SHA two fifty six hash of that first string. So this is now a. Uh, it's always going to turn out to be this length. It's then base64 URL encoded because we're going to about to put it into a URL. So then the app goes and builds the link to send the user off to the OAuth server. So this is a um, authorization code request. And there's a couple of parameters in here that are telling the OAuth server what to do. For example, uh, response type code means we're doing the auth code flow. Client ID is, that again, that public identifier of the app so the OAuth server knows which app they're trying to log into. That redirect URL is where the app is waiting to be returned, uh, to have the user be returned to. Uh, scope is what the app is trying to access. So this, again, depends on what APIs you need to access. But we could say, for example, that this app is trying to access your photos in an API. Um, state is a random string that the app just makes up also, um, although it could also be like uh, indicating where in your app you want to send the user back to, whether it's the home page or a dashboard or the checkout page or whatever it is. And then code challenge and code method. These are the pixie parameters. So this is that hash and then code challenge method is saying which hashing algorithm we use. Okay, this turns into a link that says login. The user is gonna click this and then get taken to the OAuth server. So it might be you know the Google OAuth server or the Okta OAuth server. That is where they're gonna log in and eventually the OAuth server redirects them back to the application. And um, when it redirects them back, it's either going to give an error string if something went wrong or generate an authorization code. So now the app is able to make a back channel request to exchange that authorization code for an access token. So it's gonna include, it's gonna make a post request back to the OAuth server saying, here's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm using an authorization code. Here is the code. Uh, here's the redirect URL. Here's the client ID. And uh, then also the plain text version, pre-hash, that the OAuth server is going to then hash. So for public clients, if it's a mobile app or a single page app, there is no client secret used in this request at all. 
if you are writing a web server based app, then you would include the client secret. Okay, then you get back an access token. Uh, and the app can consider the user logged in now. So let's go ahead and actually do that now. Using this application and some uh, sample code that I've got ready. So I've, I've registered the app already. Now I have a client ID and a client secret. We need to start by uh, let me let me load up this code. I've got a sort of like boilerplate. It's not even boilerplate. It's just a little bit of placeholder functions that uh, make this a little bit easier to do. So I'm right, I'm going to write this um, app in one file and. We're doing that just to demonstrate that you know it doesn't take a lot of code to do it. You would obviously probably use a framework or something to do this. But we're trying to show what's actually going on under the hood. So I've just got a PHP file here. And if I, uh, if I don't do anything first, then the user is going to be you know, logged in and see the dashboard. So if I'd like take out these, uh, these to check if the user is logged in and, and visit this. It says we're logged in. We don't know who the user is, obviously, so we're not actually logged in. But this is now not protected. This would be this would be the dashboard, right? This would be like um, the dashboard of the app. And so we're trying to protect. So we don't want this to be visible when the user is not actually logged in. So let's go ahead and add uh, add authentication to this. So first, eventually we're gonna um, we're gonna store the user's username in the session, and that's how we're gonna consider them logged in. Session is like every web web framework has this. So this is just PHP PHP's version of this. You run session start at the beginning, then you get this variable to be able to store things in it, and then when the user reloads the page, they're still there, which is like magic. Um, you know, 20 years ago when we were all first learning PHP on the web, but this is um, you know sort of the basis of of web these days. So every framework has something similar to this. You would use whatever is the most appropriate for your language. Um, so now, because we're looking for a variable in the session, I'm now not logged in. Great. We've now protected this with a check to see if the user has, if, if, there is a, if there's a session with a username uh, in it. And now we have to fill that in somehow. So what we're going to do is use an OAuth flow to first get an access token and then eventually get an ID token, which we're going to talk about in a second. So I need to, um, I have a little bit of a few variables here, which is our sort of like inline config. And we're going to go ahead and fill these in. So we're going to, we need the client ID. This is a PHP app, so it's a web server based app. So I have a client secret as well. It's running on localhost 8080. So that's the redirect URL. Now we need to actually know where are we going to send the user to to go log in. Because this application, we don't want to put a password prompt in this app because that would not be secure. And we don't want to be collecting passwords from users. We want Okta to deal with passwords. So we need to figure out where can we send users to to go log in. Um, turns out that this issuer URL is sort of a magic string. This issuer URL is if you add on this, this dot well known thing onto that URL, you actually get a URL that contains a bunch of useful information. So we've got things like the authorization endpoint and token endpoint, which are the two URLs we need in order to be able to do an OAuth exchange. There's other things in here as well, which don't really matter for now. So we're not really going to um, worry about those. So I could just copy and paste this as the URL. Uh, but because this is actually a JSON document, we can fetch this in code, making it a little bit easier to configure. So if I drop that issuer URL into my code and then add on the dot well known path and then fetch it, store it in metadata, now I can do things like metadata authorization endpoint, and it'll grab that string from up here. So cool. All right. Now we've got a, our config. And we're ready to start a no-auth flow. So if I scroll down, we're gonna we've got this little debug thing here, right? If if Octa returns us back, uh, returns back to this app with error in the query string, we're gonna show the error message. Right? So like if something goes wrong, 
we're going to end up back at the redirect URL with error equals blah, blah, blah. And then we're just going to show it on the page so we can see what happened. Okay. Here is where we're waiting for uh, the return with a authorization code. And eventually, Okta is going to return us back with code is something. And we're going to do, we're going to have to go exchange that for an access token. Um, if that's not set, then we skip all this for now. Here, around here now. So we need to actually now build up a link to send the user to go log in to Okta. So I mentioned that there's that state parameter. It's just going to be a random string that we're going to generate. Um, I also need to now make the pixie uh, code, store the pixie code verifier, the plain text, locally in this app, and then generate a hash of it and send that in the URL. So to do that, we're going to say uh, code verifier is, let's just copy this and make it a little bit longer. OK. And then code challenge is the base64 URL encoded version of hash. Uh, of the code verifier. And I think I did that right. Here's the authorization endpoint. We're going to add a bunch of query strings uh, parameters into this URL. So we need to tell the OAuth server what we're doing. Response type is code. We need to give it, we need to tell who we are. So client ID, this, it's this app that is wanting to log a user in. Uh, where is the app running? Redirect URI. Okay. Uh, we need to give it the state, which is there. And um, we need to give it a scope of something. For now, let's just say that it's contacts. So I can get through this part of the demo. And then we need to add in the code challenge. So code challenge and code challenge method. We tell Octa which hash we are using. Cool. OK, now we're going to build that into a URL, put it in this link that says login. So if I go back to the home page now, we see the link that says login. If I look at the source code, then we see we've got authorization endpoint, response type code, client ID, redirect URI state. And if I refresh, then the code challenge and the state change every time, right? Cool. So here we are. I visit this in a logged out window. Then I'm not logged into Okta in my incognito window. And if I click login, I get taken to Okta, of course. And then Okta asks me to log in. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. When I click Sign In, this is actually a feature of um, that I've got enabled on my account, the consent feature, which you really only need to do for third-party apps. It's not really necessary for first-party apps. If I click Allow, I will get redirected back to localhost 8080. And now, look, there's a code in the query string. Also, there's that state value. So now we're ready to go and finish this off. So back up to here. If there is a code in the query string, which there is now, first, I'm going to check to see if the session state matches that state. Otherwise, something's going to go, something will be wrong, right? Because like, I, like, if I just take this and put it into the other browser, state value is wrong because that means somebody is trying to do something sneaky. OK. Assuming the state value is correct, then we go talk to the token endpoint and exchange that code for an access token. So this is that post request. Grant type is authorization code. We include the code we got from the query string, which is in there. We've got client ID. Now, this is, again, a server-side app, so I am going to use my client secret. And we've also got redirect URI. And let's see what happens. Is this enough? Find out. Refresh. The authorization code expired because it turns out it's actually very short-lived. Um, they only last, I don't know exactly how long it is, but it's 
like definitely less than a minute. Start over, try again, log in. I'm already logged in, so Octa did not prompt me again. I got returned back. There's a new code, new state. And now I got an error from Octa saying, oh, Pixie code verifier is required because I used a code challenge at the beginning. So I have to also send code verifier, which is in the session. Right. Probably expired. Yeah. Start over, get a new one. And cool. Now we got an access token back. So at this point, we don't actually know who the user is. We just know that there is a user because the access token does not tell us anything about the user. You might be saying, but oh, but this is a JSON web token. And technically, yes, it is. But as far as the app is concerned, it's not. It does not matter whether it's a JSON web token because the application does not need to, should never actually try to learn anything about this access token. Just like a hotel key card. When you go to a hotel, you get that key card, you don't go and use a MagStripe reader to read the data on the card. You just go to your door, and the door deals with it. If you did try to read the data on the card, you might learn some interesting information, or you might not. It doesn't matter, because all you care about is, does it open the door? OK. So we now, um, we can't really, like, we don't know who the user is. So we have to do something else. And we have to learn the user data some other way. There is actually an API, met, uh, API in Okta to look up user information, which should be one of the endpoints here. But instead, what we're going to do is um, we are going to use OpenID Connect to go and actually learn about the user that way. So let's talk a little bit about OpenID Connect before we get back to the code. So like we saw, the access token doesn't actually tell us who logged in. The access token just tells us that someone logged in and that we could now make API requests to this imaginary API that we haven't made yet. Um, OpenID Connect is about identifying users. So again, OAuth, accessing APIs. OpenID Connect, who is the user? Identification. And OpenID Connect is not a whole new thing. It's actually built on top of OAuth. So all of the, the, the code we just wrote is actually almost already OpenID Connect, because we only need to add a tiny bit of code in order to make it an OpenID Connect request. So what exactly does OpenID Connect add? The primary thing it's adding is a new kind of token. So we saw that access token, which as an application, we're never going to worry about what it is. We're just going to send it to an API. The ID token is meant to be read by this application. This is how we learn about the user. So if your OAuth server uses JSON Web Tokens as access tokens, which Okta does, then these tokens actually look very similar at a first glance. However, it's very important to not use them interchangeably because they are not the same. And they have slightly different information in them. And the security properties of them and the model that it's based on is, assumes that they are not the same kind of thing. So these tokens are intended for different, different audiences, which is the sort of spec terms for it. The access token's audience is the API, the resource server. The ID token's audience is the application. So that's who it's going to be read by. So let's dive into JSON Web Tokens really, really quick. JSON Web Token is a three-part token used to um, encode and sign JSON data. The top part is a header that talks about how, what the structure of the token is and how it's signed. The middle part actually contains the data you care about. And the bottom part is the signature, which is how you can check whether it's valid, which is actually only necessary in some cases, as we'll find out. So this might look like it's unreadable you know, nonsense, but it turns out that it's actually um, not encrypted at all. It's just Base64 encoded. So if you take this and copy and paste it and uh, paste it into a Base64 decoder, you'll see that it's actually just JSON data. So this is, again, a really important thing to keep in mind, which is that um, the whatever data is inside this token 
the ID token for sure. And if your access tokens are JSON web tokens, then also your access tokens. That whatever you put into those tokens is visible to users and developers of these apps. So just keep that in mind as you're designing what you put in these tokens. Um, OK, to get an ID token, we're going to do the same flow we just did. We're just going to add a, a new scope to that request, because that's all you have to do to turn on OpenID Connect. You turn on OpenID Connect by adding the scope OpenID. Um, there's a couple of others defined as well, like profile, um, email, address, phone, to get other parts of the user's profile information. Probably all we care about is the name. Um, well, we could also get the, their email address as well. So the user clicks this link. Again, this is like the same thing as before. We're just going to add in scope. They're going to get sent over to the OAuth server, log in. They get redirected back with this temporary code, which we then exchange for an ID token, which will come back along with the access token. And this is a really interesting uh, difference as well, which is that um, by doing it this way, it actually doesn't matter that this ID token is a JSON web token, and we don't care about the signature anymore. All we have to do is just treat it like a weirdly encoded bit of JSON data because we don't care about the signature because we actually know where we got it from already. We got it, we got it over the back channel. So we know it came from the OpenID Connect server. We know that it's not been tampered with in transit because it's over SSL. Uh, we know that it was intended, we know it's the right ID token because we got it in, in that response to the request we started. Now, um, if you got this over the front channel, that would be a different story. But we're going to do this over the back channel because it's a lot easier and it's just faster. So again, the ID token is a JSON web token. So if you decode it, you'll see a bunch of these claims in it. Um, if you do get it over the front channel, which meant, which means that you use a different response type. So if you use response type uh, ID token, for example, you get an ID token back in the redirect, which is like it's flying over the wall, and you don't actually know where it came from. So uh, if you don't know where it came from, you have to verify it. And that's what the JSON web token is for. That's what the public key signing is for and all of that. You're going to use a library to do that because it's too much code to write by hand, which is also why I don't like doing it. Also, it's just more work. So you have to then also validate all these claims because just because you got this ID token doesn't mean it's actually for your app if it came over the front channel. You have to treat it like it's untrusted data. You have to treat it like it's an attack and verify it. And only then, um, only then actually allow it. So this is why I like the authorization code flow with OpenID Connect because um, it's so much less code. Uh, which we're going to see in a second. Um, there's another important um, attack that it prevents if you use Pixie. So it's just overall a very good idea to, to do it that way. So we're going to start. Let me go back to my code. Um, we're going to take this app and now turn it into an OpenID Connect app. So again, all I have to do is add in a scope. Let's just switch to just open ID and see what happens. And that's all I'm going to change. Again, I'm already logged into Okta here. So when I click log in, I'm going to get, re going to get redirected back immediately. Now I got redirected back and look, there's a new token. And I did, I mentioned that there um, looks the same, starts with the same few letters. There's a dot around there. It's about the same length because they are both JSON web tokens, but we're going to ignore this one and we're going to only use the ID token. This is how we're going to find out information about the user. So if I take this middle chunk, again, I don't care that it's a JSON web token right now because we got it over the back channel. So if I just take this chunk and go over to a base64 decoder, you can see what's in it. There's a lot of stuff in here that we don't care about. Um, it's only important in the front channel. But this is the main one. This is the thing that identifies the user. So subject sub is short for subject, which is essentially the uh, unique user ID for this user account. It is not a username, and it's not an email address. It's not um, meant to be human readable. It is guaranteed to be uh, unique and stable for this user. So even if the user changes their email, this stays the same. This is the one you want to use to say, like, this is who logged in. So uh, we don't really know. We don't know anything else about the user. We just know that someone 
with this subject logged in. So at this point, we could actually now um, write code that does that. So we're going to go back to our response. We're going to get the, you know, we're going to use that authorization code, get the uh, access token, or right, here, which is what we see printed out, right? This is what we've printed out here, access token response. We're going to now continue and say, if there is an ID token in the response to this, then we're going to now do this. Um, this is why, again, I think it's a little bit silly that it's wrapped up this way. But we're going to take this string. We're going to split it on the dots, right? We're going to grab the middle part, which is this. We're going to then base64 decode that, which gets us this. We're going to then JSON decode that so we can actually access these values in code. And now we're going to use them. So let's say, actually, subject is user info sub, which is the sort of most appropriate way to, to make sure that we are um, we know who actually is logged in. So this way, if we were to like create a record in a database, for example, we would want to make sure that this sub is the key, that user. That way, when they come back, even if their email is different, they get back to the same user account. So OK, we're going to store that. And then we don't know who they are, who they are yet, so we're just going to say hello and show their subject. And then back up at the top, we're going to change this to say, if there is a subject in the session, then they are logged in. So start over, log in, we get redirected back. It found the subject out of that basically foreign code adjacent string. And now when we go home, we got the dashboard and we are logged in as this user. So now this is you know not something you actually want to show to a user. We want to know who they are so we can put their name on this page instead. So to do that, we're going to go add a new scope, which is profile. And while we're at it, we'll just also add email. Log out and log back in. And now, if we take a look at this middle chunk and base64 decode it, we got some actually useful information. We got the user's name and their email. Email should only be used to actually like contact them. You don't want to store this as the, the user ID in your database because they might change it or they might this might end up on somebody else's account later. Always use the subject as the user identifier. But we can now greet them. So we can go back up here and say where we extracted the sub, we're going to also now put the name, their name in the session. And we can also put the email in the session. And now up here in our dashboard, we can say logged in as and show their name. Here, log out, back in, get a new ID token, store everything in the session. Oh, I forgot to change it there. Um, but if I go back to the dashboard, it now shows the user's name. Cool. So that is how we actually now have protected this dashboard, you know, of course, in your real application, like this is going to be a whole the whole application there. But this code now only runs if there is a valid user who logged in through your Okta org. And nobody else can actually visit this link now and see this dashboard. So um, let me take a look at the questions real quick. The uh, so the access token. Um, this is a uh, the access token we haven't really used here because we were protecting this website, this application, by using the ID token to figure out who logged in, and we now only know we we only get an ID token if it's a valid user in the Okta org, which which we can now manage the the users over in Okta. And that's where we can, uh, you can see I've got a couple other user accounts up here. Um, that is where we can decide who gets access to this application. Great. Um, the access token isn't really useful for this app because all the data lives in this app. If this app needed to access an API, that's what the access token would be for. So um, we can, we can, I can walk through this code, which I wrote yesterday. Um, 
this is probably more than we actually care about but let's let's yeah let's do that so let's pretend that we're building an api and um the api that we're going to build is going to show us a list of photos that belong to this user. Now, the important thing to remember here is that this API is going to be on a totally separate server from the application. Right? That's generally the architecture that you've got. You've got APIs on the back end. You've got the application, which might be a single page app. Um, you might have a uh, application that's a mobile app, and that's going to be on in the user's hands accessing a remote API. So this is the remote, remote API now. Um, the, the application, we're going to mimic the application by uh, just using a command, the command line. And we're going to do that by sending a request to the, app, the API, which uh, I should technically be running this on a separate port, but that's too much work right now. Um, so we're going to send the access token in a header authorization bearer, and then we're going to go grab the access token from we're going to grab a new access token because I didn't save them from before. Grab this access token and put it there and see what happens. So if we hit this API, um, let me actually make an API request without the token. And uh, OK, so what I did was if there is no access token, this API is going to grab a list of files in that photos folder and show only the ones that are in there, which are public photos. And you can see that list of file names matches, right? OK. We're going to only show the ones in the secret folder if there is a valid access token. So if there's no access token set, we just return the public photos. If there is an access token set, we need to actually validate the access token. Now, there's more than one way to do this. The easiest and least amount of code way to do it, but the probably the worst way is to every on every API request go and fetch um, request from the authorization from the introspection endpoint back to Okta asking if the token is valid. So we send the access token over to Okta to check if it's valid. And if it is, we will get back uh, response active is true. So if I send this with an invalid token, then Okta says it's not valid and we return back invalid token. So we're able to now protect this API using an access token. If I send a valid one, we should now see uh, something, which is, I think I probably just copied that wrong. Um, you know, that's right. I bet my client ID and secret are wrong because I deleted that application. So I have to go add a new application for the API, which is uh, here. Get a new client ID and client secret for that API to be able to check tokens. And when I do this, try the request again. OK. So it says something different now, which is unauthorized. Why does it say that? Well, because. I actually want to protect this API and only let applications access the API if the access token includes the scope photos. I'm going to go back to my app, add the scope photos into the request, go get a new access token. Now we've got a, got a prompt, right? It wants access to my photos. Let's go grab the access token. and use this in the request and now we've got the secret photo so this is the api code now um if they're forget about this get rid of that that's distracting um we check the list of scopes in the token if there is no photo scope we error out if there is, we now also grab the secret photos and return those in the result as well. So now we've able, we're able to um, run different code on the API. You could also just say, like, if there is no access token, you could just say uh, unauthorized here. 
and now it's a private API that has no public, uh, you have to have an access token to access it. So that's the easy way. There's more better ways to do this, which are, I will save for a separate session. Um, there's also a lot of videos on our YouTube that go over this stuff as well. Um, let me take a look at the questions real quick and then wrap up. Um, so here's a question about how to um, how to protect a token-based REST API method. If we pass a token for each request, it will show in the browser console, and middlemen can misuse the token. This is a this is a valid concern. Um, if you're if you're writing a single page app that's running in a browser and that is where the access token lives and is being used from, then there is always a risk that something could extract that token whether that's a different browser extension on your machine or the user doing it intentionally themselves or anything like that, right? The number of ways to actually extract that, there, there are some and they are worth concerning yourself with. It's mainly around cross-site scripting attacks. So like every JavaScript that you embed on your page has access to that page. So like your analytics, your, your ad trackers, all that could be extracting these tokens and you would ever know. That is a valid concern. Um, if you, however, it is not necessarily so much of a concern that it's it's not worth doing it this way. So, if you are, um, if this is a concern and you you are not willing to have any of that risk at all, then the best way to do it is to not have access tokens in the browser, and you use HTTP cookies instead, where your access token lives up on a server that backend that supports the single page app. So that's. The sort of more secure architecture in that in that model. The um, but yeah, like I said, it's not always a concern because if you've audited your code and you know exactly what scripts are there and you've made sure there's no cross-site scripting attacks possible on your app, then uh, you can deal with access tokens in a browser because you've reduced the number of ways that it, they could be extracted. Um, I will make sure to send the sample code out. So a few people asking about that. Um, so expiration dates around access tokens and ID tokens, actually. Um, the, both the ID token and the access token are going to expire. So if we have, if we look at the access, the access token response here, the access token lasts for two hours in this case, it's up to the server to decide that. Um, but again, this is, that's really only the concern of the API. So the API is going to go validate the access token and it would be able to check whether the token's expired. Um, it's the ID token that we care about when we're trying to protect this application. The ID token does have an expiration date as well. And uh, again, if we look at the base64 decoded, there's a timestamp of when it expires. So yes, technically, this application should only um, consider this user to be logged in for this amount of time. And you might do that by um, when you actually set the session cookie for this app, setting it to expire at that time, or actually storing this ID token um, client side, like in the application and checking it on every request. So um, if you're doing that, for example, like if I, uh, if I, let me go back to my, my app. What we did here was um, we, we extract the data out of the ID token and save that in the session. We now don't have the concept of this expiring. If instead we actually say, um, ID token and store the whole thing, then we can actually now check the expiration date. We could even just say session ex expires in you know, at some point, right? Um, this is now stored server side, like on this application's web server. So we can now use this checking locally to see if it expires. And then if it's now past that timestamp, we kick the user out and get them to log in again. If you're doing a, so, so there's no traffic back to Okta in that case, right? Because this is the ID token intended for the app checking the expiration date itself. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Um, and I think that's all the time we have. We're about at the top of the hour. Let me quickly just talk about where to go for some more things to read and learn about because this was just scratching the surface of this stuff, and there's a lot more to it um, and a lot more details to learn. So OAuth.com is the electronic version of the book that I wrote, um, OAuth 2 Simplified. And 
that is a great place to go for a lot more of these in-detailed questions. Um, there's also the OAuth Playground, which is a good uh, walkthrough of uh, the authorization code plus Pixie flow, like we saw, but also all the other flows. And you can see how they work and look at the requests that are being made. Um, the Octave Developer blog is a great resource for um, tutorials in different languages and frameworks. And that's a great place to go to, again, dive into the details about specific frameworks and languages that you might be using, since you probably are not writing your application in one PHP file like I just did. Um, we also have a YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash octadev. I'm actually going to be doing a live stream in an hour there. And we do every week a OAuth happy hour where we talk about uh, answer questions from the audience, as well as talk about um, latest news in the OAuth world. So that'll be a fun time as well. Um, if you do want a print copy of the book that I wrote, they're available here, OAuth2Simplified.com. So uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. I hope you got something out of it, even this, though this was a very quick session. But we did manage to throw in some information about API security in there as well. So yeah, thank you all for joining. <laughs>